This is a Digital Music Trends 166 on the 15th of January 2014. This week on the show, the latest US streaming numbers, then we talk about Pandora, Mixcloud, Wide, the value of curation and of playlists, Samsung and Deezer's talks, and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available as an audio and video podcast on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio and Audioboo. And to get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at Trends or email us on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And on digitalmusictrends.com there's also a voluntary subscription option right now so if you tune in every week and would like to contribute to the running of the show you can go and take a look on the site and it's uh, on the right hand side of the screen and uh, thanks uh, so much uh, to those who have already signed up actually and this week on the show it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, two fantastic new guests so first up Andrew Dubber professor of music industries innovation at Birmingham City University and also author of the book uh, Radio in the Digital Age as well as uh, uh, organizer of Music Tech Fest too so hi Andrew and great to have you on how's it going? Oh, it's going very well. Thanks very much for having me, Andrea. It's a great to have you for the first time. I can't believe it's taken so long. And then we have uh, Camille Ainsworth uh, from Digital Marketing and PR agency Charm Factory. So hi, Camille, and great to have you on. Uh, hello, how are you? Absolutely fine. Yeah, it's a, it's a good day. It's a busy day, but that's, that's also good. Today, I would like to start uh, with uh, a follow-up from last week's show, actually, where we talked about the BPI and Nielsen figures for UK and US recorded music sales. Uh, well, uh, a couple of days after we recorded the show, Nielsen actually released the official numbers for 2013, which included the all-important streaming data. So uh, overall, music streams were up 32%, and these include audio, Spotify, YouTube, Slash Vivo, Zoom, Cricket, and Medianet. Uh, if we look at on-demand audio streaming services alone, uh, that figure is even higher with an increase of 103% over 2012. So as we mentioned last week, uh, digital track sales were down in both the US and the UK, signaling perhaps that they reached uh, a peak in 2012 and that 20, from 2013 onwards we're going to see a decline on that side, uh, which is, uh, might be proportional to the increase of prominence uh, uh, for uh, streaming services. So uh, first of all, uh, do you think, did you think that this was going to happen quite as fast as it did? Uh, Andrea, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? And, and were you surprised to see this decline uh, right away from 2013 and uh, uh, such an increase in streaming as well? I have to be perfectly honest, I pay almost no attention whatsoever to statistics like that, mostly because there is nothing that you can glean from trends like this. Yeah. Um, if, if something declines by 10% in one year from, from one year to another, or increases by 20% from one year to another, that's no predictor of the following year. I mean, one of the things, uh, one of the pieces of statistics I think that uh, came out a couple of years back was that uh, the, and then the headline was something along the lines of the British music industry has seen an upsurge of X percent uh, of music sales in that particular year. And you look at the data closely enough and you go, no, Adele released a record. And, and really, when, once you start getting outliers like that, where, where people are behaving in a particular way because of things that are not to do with mass movements of people or, or, or mass trends, I mean, people are acting individually. That's, that's one of the things to bear in mind. As, and these things are always far more complex than they appear. So aggregated numbers, in my world, basically mean nothing. Uh, and, and so that any kind of knowledge that you can get from that, and, and also that they don't tell you anything useful, uh, because if, for instance, I run an independent record label, and I uh, have things on Spotify, and I have things on Deezer, and I have things on you know, all, all these different services, knowing that more people streamed this year than last year doesn't tell me to do anything. There's no kind of yep. extra information or, or actionable knowledge that can result from that. It's, it's interesting to know from a... From a um, uh, a macroeconomics perspective um, and I guess if you've got data that goes back 10 or 15 years, once these sort of things are tracked over time, you can get some kind of relevant historical perspective on what's happened, yeah. but actually predicting or, uh, I mean, predicting is something you shouldn't try to do in the first place. I mean, you should try and create the conditions for your, your success, um, but also trying to kind of um, choose your behaviors based on what you think everybody out there is doing. It's kind of nonsense because everybody is, is doing all sorts of different stuff and that aggregates to these kind of numbers and shifts, if sure. that makes sense. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Camille, what are your thoughts on this? Do, do you agree with Andrew that we can't really glean much from, from the data? That's definitely an interesting and refreshing perspective on, on his end. Um, definitely to some extent. When I think about it, um, the music, it's, it's true. It's about things like... Um, yeah, what's been released, what people um, want to listen to, just the quality of what people are actually even putting out. And that has to go across all creative industries about what you're going to, that when you're talking about who's buying what and why. Yeah. And on the other hand, and um, uh, you made the point about um, 
whether or not you can actually tell anything about what you should go and do from an increase in numbers. And I think you actually can. You can make a decision on um, whether or not you focus your resources on that or not. And I think that is what labels are doing. One of the reasons why it's probably grown last year is because labels have gone away and they've had people looking at how to increase people listening on Spotify and listening on Deezer. And, and that's just probably one of the latest things that um, have come into their remit, really, to do. And yeah, yeah. I guess it shows that they've had some success. Yeah, and you think that that also influences the, the, the strategy and the, and, the, and the the digital strategy of of labels? It definitely does. It definitely does, and we see it here. So, um, people are going to be putting in follow links um, to Spotify profiles, and they are going to continue to try and cultivate um, a community around that point of sale kind of element where they're actually going to be um, profiting from people listening so yeah. yeah yeah sure that's interesting and and definitely we're going to keep an eye on these numbers and, uh, and we're going to report on the uh, IFBI as well and what they usually come up with uh, as a worldwide sort of uh, stats for the year and looking at you know the yeah, past couple of years as well and see what's happening on that front and uh, uh, you know I, I want to talk a little bit about startups because uh, I, I like talking about startups as well and uh, we all know it's a tough world out there uh, but thankfully there's still some funding to go around as French based music service wide has closed around for 700k in seed funding to further its goal to become the service people use to save and collect the music they discover on the web. Uh, and there's a few companies that do uh, you know, similar type of things as well, of course, uh, but they wide uh, especially allow uh, people to collect music from desperate sources like Spotify, YouTube, Deezer, and different uh, uh, blogs. Uh, so a Panda Daily uh, article likens, likens it to an Insta paper for audio, which is not a bad analogy really for the service. Uh, and uh, this is one of my per personal favorite subjects, which is to do has to do with pooling uh, uh, together your experience experiences online to find a way to, to gather them all together and, and remedy the problem of data fragmentation. So, uh, you know, uh, we can actually uh, start talking about uh, Music Tech Fest with Andrew uh, in a second, but as far as why is concerned and uh, being able to gather that data, uh, Camille, do you think that there's a, a, a one company can uh, solve that problem or is there t are people too sort of jumpy, do they jump from service to another too much for them to actually stick around with uh, one particular company that does this type of aggregation for, for a long time? Um, I think people will stick, will commit to one. Um, I personally, it's not in my character to do that. I will yeah. jump around and try new things, but I think other people will stick to one service because it's, you know, people don't really like a lot of change if they can avoid it. Um, I like the idea of them pairing people with similar music tastes. I think that's really positive. I think the biggest issue that they all face is marketing. Yeah. They don't really know how to market it very well and actually make themselves stand out from the other um from the other services and also sometimes they get a bit carried away with what I see as more like gimmicks so even with Soundwave with all the backing that it's had and all the fancy PR that it had actually I don't really care who else in Camden is listening to it and what they're listening to yeah. I, you know I don't see how that's relevant to me but maybe that's that is me and I'm quite particular and I think <laughs> about that kind of thing but um, realistically they've got to think about what's going to really benefit the user and how they're going to market it. And it's the same with all these services. They don't often think about what the actual final end user, which is the music fan, what they need enough. There's so much focus on the industry and on what technology can do. There's not enough focus on actually thinking about what people need it to do yeah. and what will make their lives better. Yeah. yeah. Andrew, do you feel like uh, this kind of startup uh, can take off uh, in, in, in today's uh, world? And I'm sure you know, you're seeing a lot of different uh, concepts as well uh, as you're working with the Music Tech, tech Fest at the moment as well. Yeah, there's, there's uh, like you say, a lot of movement in this area. And there are a lot of people who are trying kind of uh, a bunch of different takes on this. I happen to like Song Drop uh, as, as an example of these sorts of uh, aggregation of things that I can find online but I can listen to in, in my way. And I, I love the story of the origin of Song Drop because it's a bunch of people who got together and said, we want something for us that, that we're just going to make in our spare time. And then, wait a minute, we have a product here. Yeah. Um, but the idea of this kind of uh, perpetual growth fetish that, that a lot of uh, um, startups have is not just we want to make something useful that, that, that is sustainable and that we can make a business out of. We have to take over the world and we have to be sold to a billion, for a billion for Facebook. I, I, I'm hoping that's starting to go away, that people are trying to make things that 
uh, kind of sustainable businesses, not just yeah. kind of uh, the, the bubble mentality of we have to make something that's enormous. Why it could be successful as anything with me never having heard of it, and that would be absolutely fine. It doesn't have to be one of these things that everybody uses. But if it fits into somebody's lifestyle and it fits into how somebody likes to consume music, then then great. And if they can make a business out of that and they can make a model out of that, that's, that's kind of the, the sustainability ethic that I'm, I'm really trying to push in this, in this sphere. Yeah. But uh, like you say, with Music Tech Fest, we're dealing with so many... I mean, there are, you would just not believe how many music industry startups there are on the planet right now. Um, and I have some idea. I try, I try and do one interview a week with, one, with some of them. So yeah, so. Well, you, you'll, you'll be here for the rest of your life if you just deal with who's, who's operating now. But, uh, but yeah. the interesting thing is so many of them have this, this um, winner-takes-all mentality about it, that, that we have to be the biggest and we have to be the best. And, uh, and actually, once you sort of get them all in a room together and working with hackers and technologists and musicians and the rest of it, the kind of the realization when you're confronted with just how much is out there, it's, it's like a, a novelist who wants to write the one big bestseller or it's not worth you know, starting to type. Um, you, you start to realize, actually, no, I can just be useful and I can contribute and I can, I can have a sustainable um, business in this field. And, and that's Actually, I think it's a lot more healthy. Yeah, I mean th th that's that's the, the key word sustainable that you that you say there because uh, some of the concepts that we are seeing that, or, or that I'm seeing proposed. Uh, uh, they, it feels like they could only work at scale just because otherwise the financials wouldn't stack up. Is that, is that your, your feeling as well? Well, that, that's the problem of uh, venture capital, which yeah. is, you know, we, we've put a lot of money into this. You have to make us a lot of money. It has to be enormous or why did we even have a meeting in the first place? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that the, what I'm seeing, which is really kind of encouraging, is there's lots of bootstrapping going on in this space now. There's lots of people who are going, yeah, we don't need to be 30% owned by a venture capitalist for, uh, you know, we don't need first class flights to, to San Francisco to have meetings and we don't need all of those things. We can actually just get in a room and we can code things. I mean, one of my favorite stories, I, I'm on the board of advisors for Bandcamp. Yeah. And one of the things I love about Bandcamp is they spent the first, I don't know, 18 months, their office was uh, a local public library and they all sat around, bought their laptops. Uh, and a cup of coffee, and they sat around and they worked. And, and, and until they were at the point of sustainability, they didn't need premises. And they worked on IRC. They had people in a couple of different countries. But it was this idea of, no, we're just going to build it, and we're going to make it useful, and we're going to make it good. And I think I, I, I really admire that kind of um, approach to the startup sector. Yeah, uh, sure. Camille, do, do you agree that, that there might be space here for also companies that are not necessarily huge, but the, that are sustainable in this, in this space as well? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are starting these businesses without much of a business model or because they quite fancy what they think the lifestyle is. And they come in here and we have meetings with them and it's it's terrifying. Um, I think there is it, there will be more um, services that are going to be smaller and just more sensible, really, I think yeah. is probably the key. Because they are a creative industry and in creative industries you can't no one ever thinks that big i mean it's almost a similar problem to what people have what the bands have in music they think yeah. oh they, they see people getting really big and then thinking oh well, i can do that i'm really good and um it just doesn't always work out and there is an element of luck and there is an element of people being really really well prepared and skills and um i yeah i think that's probably the situation right yeah, now absolutely from our no. it, it, it makes it makes a lot of sense sure uh, and uh, andrew uh, you were talking about music tech fest so can, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's happening with that and what are the what are the news really well you picked a good day to ask me that on because we've just had a couple of really interesting things uh, confirmed Great. um music tech fest has been happening in london for the last two years uh, and it's an event where we bring together uh, the music industry, we bring together music tech startups, we bring together hackers, musicians, artists, all sorts of people in that space and put them in a room together and uh, people show what they do. It's kind of, I guess you'd think of it halfway between uh, TED Talks with performance and a hack event and uh, and all of these things kind of rolled into together. Yeah. But it's a really interesting collaborative space. We're taking it worldwide this year. I've just sort of come on board as festival director uh, we're, we've just confirmed uh, we're doing Wellington in New Zealand at the end of February. Uh, we're going to awesome. Microsoft Research Labs in Boston at the end of March. We're doing the Barbican in May. Uh, and uh, then we're going to LA in July. And then Brazil in September. And we've got a whole bunch wow, of other... Wow, that's cool. Yeah, so we've got a bunch of other places that have come to us and go, can you do a Music Tech Fest here? That sounds really interesting. And the cool thing about it for me is... Because I, I went to last year's Music Tech Fest. Yeah, me too. It was great. I, well, I got really excited about it. And, and I've, I've ended up kind of organizing it. Um, and one of the exciting things for me is there isn't really anything like this, which A, uh, it's not uh, incredibly prohibitively expensive to go to. 
Uh, it's been free in recent years, and we're going to. I think we're looking at something like a ten quid nominal um, entry fee for for people who just want to attend. Um, and uh, but it's a space in which we can put together people who are doing the latest academic research at PhD level and put them in the same room with music industry people and go, look, this is actually useful to you. You can invent new stuff. You can create the future of the music industry. You don't have to um, predict it or wait for it to happen to you, which is you know, what I, the point I was making earlier about statistics, which is this kind of um, reactive approach to uh, music industry innovation. I sure. really like the, the kind of, well, let's just get our hands dirty and build something and see what happens if we do that. And so some of the uh, collaborations that have come out of Music Tech Fest in the past have been really, really powerful. But um, now that we're sort of Taking this model and this concept to the world, I think that um, we're starting to get starting to really build up some momentum in terms of brands getting involved and uh, and and just sort of people seeing the real potential of what happens if we give this group of people our, our you know our mobile devices or or our you know our sneakers that we want to sell or these sorts yeah. of things. What can they build out of them and and uh, what what can we associate with music? And I think. But that's a really exciting space to be in right now. That's awesome. And uh, the website to go on is musictechfest.org. Obviously, uh, you can go and check that out and see uh, the, all, the, all the events that are happening as they roll in. And uh, Camille, uh, while we're, we're working on, 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 on plugs uh, sort of halfway through the show, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, Charm Factory. So what, what do you guys do and uh, how, how should people get in touch if they, if they want to, uh, to look into working with you? Well, we're a PR and marketing um, ad, uh, agency for bands, artists, musicians, and also we work with brands. Um, we work across majors and independents, so everyone at the moment from John Newman to um, a band called Dali who are quite new, and we do also their social management as well. Um, so we'll work on everyone's profiles and putting together um, a strategy so that a campaign feeds in well to what's happening actually in um, in the rest of the PR. Yeah. Um, you can find out more about us on our roster at charmfactory.com. Co.uk, um, awesome. and the, all our contact details, details are there. That's great, yeah. thanks. So, again, it's uk And uh, 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 I wanted to move on actually awesome. by talking about radio. And uh, today there's actually quite a big radio heavy lineup, uh, which uh, is good because Andrew has actually written a book on radio, so it's definitely good to have you on. And uh, there's a working radio. I used to work in radio, so perfect. Uh, perfect, did, panel yeah. to, perfect panel to have on today. And so, uh, I want to start with uh, Pandora. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, the co-founders uh, Tim uh, Westgren, uh, Westgren and Tom Conrad gave a two-hour interview at Pando Daily, uh, uh, which uh, at the fireside chats of Pando Daily at CES in Las Vegas. So the video is available online. I'll throw a link in the show notes, and it's definitely worth the two hours of your time if you're interested in knowing more about Pandora's backstory. You can keep it running in the background. It's definitely quite interesting uh, if you if you're doing something uh, not particularly interesting at work. Uh, they uh, they elaborate on the current controversies around payments surrounding not just Pandora but on-demand services uh, like Spotify as well and uh, you know uh, Westergren believes that the industry has to rebuild itself uh, on a new premise one that starts with an acceptance of the commerce uh, is more challenging when people pay a, a dollar for a product than the originally uh, the, than the original twenty dollars that were charged for an album uh, back in the day so uh, of course you know they are quite uh, bullish because the company is doing really well uh, in December they had like uh, some fantastic stats on listeners and the stock jumped to 14 percent just in one day it's uh, all-time highs so the company is appears to be holding up really well even given the threat of other services coming into play and so i wanted to ask you uh, first of all a generic question that uh, comprises both the us uk european market you know how do you how do you see internet radio moving forward uh, uh, andrew uh, as far as trying to balance the uh, payments uh, with the sustainability of the companies with the artist requests that are uh, that are of course uh, uh, very legitimate well, the first, the first thing to clarify, when you say Pandora, we're, and we're considering that to be radio online, because that, that, I mean, that's the first question that I, I would ask, is the extent to which that's a useful uh, metaphor for something that actually does very little to do with what radio has traditionally done. It's, yeah. it's, it's transmitted in a different way, it's organized in a different way, the people who work in it do different, completely different jobs, how people listen to it is different. So the, in this, I mean, I, I kind of like to distinguish radio from the streaming music service. That's very, that's very interesting, actually, because uh, I, I've been at panels where actually people were defining everything as radio. So yeah, it's definitely interesting to hear you say that. 
I, I spend the first two chapters of my book going, well, it's complicated. Um, and, and, and I think it is. And I think it's important that it's complicated and that we actually ask really, I mean, it seems like uh, arguing about semantics, but, but actually it's really important when you think about what is this like, because actually it's not like anything that we've had before. And so we need to approach it on its own terms. And that's important when it comes to things like organizing who should pay whom and for what. Um, because if you're using an older model for going, well, radio pays us this much, you go, well, yes, but this isn't radio and this works in a different way. And that might mean that Pandora should pay more. It might mean they should pay less. It might mean that, uh, that certainly might mean that record labels should be paying artists at a different rate than they currently are for things that they're, you know, not actively using for promotion. All, all of these sorts of questions are up for grabs. And I think if you go, well, it's, it's just radio on the internet, uh, it shuts down a lot of interesting questions about, now, what is this actually doing? Where is the value created? How should the money move in order for that to happen? Yeah. And, and actually quite a lot of the time, who should pay who money is the least interesting bit of that conversation in terms of, you know, what does this mean for people and how does it uh, change their, their relationship with music? Um, what can we do with it once we've got it? Uh, can you use it for promotion? Or is this, you know, I mean, it's all, all these sorts of questions because if you're talking about Pandora, for instance, um, somebody is choosing that music or an algorithm is choosing that music based on things that you've selected. Um, there isn't a promotional channel that's going through that. There isn't a program director who's selecting a playlist who's going, you know, here is a meal, you eat it. Um, it so the kind of the value in all sorts of ways, culturally and economically, um, get moved around a whole lot. So I think it's one of those things that you need to start from first principles and, and, and not just go, it's not fair, somebody needs to pay me more money, but actually make a case for, well, this is the value we create, this is the chain of value, and here is where uh, we can make this sustainable or not sustainable. I mean, it, it, people can pick their toys and go home, as you know, um, Tom York's done from, from Spotify, for instance. Yeah. But, um, but you need to actually kind of understand the medium on its own terms before you start doing that. Yeah, sure. Camille, do you feel like, uh, uh, w w you know, I'm quite interested in the UK market as well. Do you feel like in the UK we could see a model, a uh, Pandora-like startup uh, take off? I know there are some issues uh, around rates, but, uh, you know, do you think that here we have a different culture and people are still used to the mainstream Radio 2s and Radio 1s of, of this world? Definitely. You know, we've got the BBC um, and those are very, very strong audiences, the very large audiences, and it's really good quality. So I think it's going to be completely different in america they had things like jack fm that came in and they tried to launch it in the uk and it just didn't work at all yeah. um, and that was the network of radio where they didn't have any presenters and it was huge in america so you've got a very different kind of radio industry over here um in uh, in online um you're right it's really really clouded because you have got these services that are just effectively just the computer telling you what to listen to yeah. um, but then you do also have people you know student radio stations are increasingly just online and they're great fun and it's not the best quality radio but it's actually it is structured in the same way as the BBC might structure or that um, one of the global uh, brands might structure their station so it's, yeah. it is about thinking about the amount of work that goes into it um, and, and yeah, and listeners, and it's a really complicated area. Yeah, absolutely. Basically, <laughs> well, Ofcom have often said in the UK that they don't want to deal with online radio. Basically, they don't want to regulate it. Um, that might have changed recently. It's been a while since I've worked in radio, but that was because they realised just how murky it was and actually how difficult it is to police. Yeah. Um, and and when it's open up to being all over the world as well. Yeah. Uh, being online, it's, it gets very, very tricky. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another uh, company that I, I'm really uh, attached to because I've known them since they, they launched uh, uh, that I want to talk about was Mixcloud because they launched a, new, a brand new website to, uh, today, actually, uh, that uh, is a, sort of called their Mixcloud X project because it's a complete overhaul of the design of their of their homepage on the web, which actually reflects uh, the updated design that they uh, gave their iOS and Android app and, and, the, and the, uh, also the added functionality in there as well. Uh, so now there's a queuing system that's been added so you can actually queue the shows that you want to listen to on Mixcloud. And, uh, and the company has got some uh, really impressive numbers. It now has uh, uh, over half a million, uh, co you know, content uh, uh, you know, creators that, that are uh, uploading content to the platform. It's, it's got uh, loads of long form content from DJ mixes to, to radio shows to all sorts of stuff on there, really. And uh, it's really... Uh, 
interesting to see how it's grown uh, as you were mentioning Andrew as a bootstrap company as well that didn't really take in any any massive VC funding uh, over the past uh, five years really so mm. uh, yeah I mean I'm quite excited about it and uh, I really hope that they that they keep growing uh, Andrew what is your take on Mixcloud and do you think they can they can ex keep expanding the way they have uh, I don't know if they can keep expanding the way they have um, I think that that's nice that they're going through incremental change yeah. uh, and I, I think there's there's lots of room for them to do more and more interesting things too but um, I've, I mean I've been a big fan of Mixcloud since they started uh, and, and I'm one of these people that sort of uploads mixes to it and, and uh, but also uh, old radio programs that I've made I mean this is the sort of it's currently my archive for radio programs that I made a decade ago um, yeah. and it, it means that when I want to kind of revisit them or, or point something towards them I've got a, a URL that I can simply do that to and I think uh, that uh, Nickel from Mixcloud is quite keen to um, get more more radio uh, content, more sort of radio, radiophonic content, I guess, mixes of uh, spoken word and music or interview-based stuff um, because it's, it is very much known as a DJ mix platform. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot more potential to it than that. I mean, if people started thinking of it as, um, I don't know, uh, a way of, of doing long-form spoken word stuff or... Um, uh, or, or that kind of radio program production uh, mentality to make something and present it on the web as a finished thing. I think Mixcloud is a really good platform for that, uh, particularly if they uh, give us lots of alternatives for embedding. Because yeah. uh, one of the one of the problems I always had with Mixcloud was this sort of square embed thing, which was a, a picture that had a, a playlist behind it. Um, and I'd like to sort of have a little bit more kind of uh, flexibility about that. And hopefully, I haven't seen the new redesign today, but uh, hopefully, there's uh, an element of that in the mix as well. Yeah, uh, Camille, have you have you used Mixcloud in, in your work as well? And do you feel like artists can use a platform like that to that if they produce mixes to really uh, gather an audience and, and make the most out of that? You know that, that talent of mixing, and, and it's not actually easy to find platforms where you can put f fully finished mixes uh, up and, and they're going to stay mm -hmm. up because most of the time they get taken down. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. It's definitely favourable in that sense that they actually pay licences. Um, we actually find that generally the artists that we work with, they don't have enough time to do regular mixes that they might put it up there and create a following. Um, and I, certainly if we're doing our job right and they're getting more and more popular, they're going to have less and less time and they don't really want to have to think about doing that. Um, quite often we'll take a playlist or a mix and it will be used multiple times in different areas and things like that. Sure. Um, I think there are probably better areas for them to use that kind of content. Yeah. Um, if not for a third-party site, um, media site or on their Spotify or something like that. There are different places where they can use it. Yeah. So it's not been something we use regularly, no. Um, and I do think it's been used for some competitions and things in the past. I wasn't involved in that. Um, but I do think they're a really good team. And But I would be wondering about how they're going to um, grow it more. Yeah. Like I've never really worked out how they made any kind of revenue, really. But uh, it's, it's always been not spent a lot of time looking at it. Yeah, I mean, Mixcloud is always, it's always an interesting story because um, I'm sure I talked about this before on the show, but they, they, they've always been able to uh, create uh, brand partnerships that enable the site to uh, generate enough revenue to keep it running and, and to to keep it growing sort of at a, at a reasonable rate. I think it's still uh, under uh, 15 or 20 people, uh, uh, the team uh, right now, and they've sort of slowly expanded over the years. So uh, I think they've, they've always managed to sort of keep the platform running on the money that they generated through brand sponsorship. So that's that's an interesting thing. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's pretty cool of them. Uh, but uh, I just on, like from so, our sure. point of view, I'm not sure, I'm not sure like from our point of view what they really give to brands that is going to, keep brands coming back to them I think yeah. um, we think like I've met the team they're really great they've got a lot of great ideas it's there's something in it but I just don't know how if we were talking to brand how we would justify it and how malleable it would be to be in a in a campaign yeah and uh, uh, finally Camilla I know you have to run in in a couple of minutes but I just wanted to ask you about uh, the latest additions to SoundCloud so SoundCloud unveiled uh, uh, a few new features on its messaging service uh, uh, system within the platform so this comes on the heels of uh, uh, 
some uh, changes that were made by uh, Twitter that made its direct uh, DMs more prominent within the t Twitter platform and also Instagram that introduced uh, 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 the opportunity to share uh, images privately and uh, uh, SoundCloud had, hadn't really done a lot of work on its uh, uh, direct messaging platform for a long time but uh, the update actually makes it a lot sleeker it looks really nice like a, like a sort of a fancy e web email client almost uh, you can actually embed uh, uh, tracks as links but they come up as little widgets now uh, you know you can actually message tracks uh, directly from the share button on SoundCloud, which is a big thing. So they, they really put this feature, uh, uh, you know, they made it a bit more prominent than it was before, a, a lot more prominent, actually. So, uh, Camilla, uh, in, your, in your experience of using SoundCloud, do you think this is going to be something that uh, enables a better communication, a one to one communication between fans and also between uh, artists and fans? Um, I wouldn't say between artists and fans, but just general, if we're working, I mean, some of our clients don't use. SoundCloud. They yeah. refuse to use SoundCloud, which is fair enough. They've got various protocol they have to stick to. But for other stuff, I think it's just going to be easier in general for um, us to manage those accounts, you know, yeah. just to be able to communicate privately with people. Just, it makes sense. We don't use it a lot for fan engagement, but we do have some artists that are amazing on there for fan engagement. But they use the public ones and they, you know, they post um, along their own songs, like maybe insight into a song, or like um, maybe how they've done something, how they've made something, maybe even like an instrument instrument they might have used, and then they respond to the fans um, on the the public comments below, and we find that actually has a much better effect than whether or not you can send out um, a message. I don't know. Can you do group emailing? That would be good. That would be good. I don't think that's possible. Followers. Yeah, um, no, that would be amazing, <laughs> but no, it yeah. can happen. I think You've I have no real way of like contacting. You can have seven hundred followers, but how do you contact those individuals? I know the DMT has got like twenty thousand nine hundred, and I can't. It's yeah. <laughs> it is quite frustrating. Just got to hope that they go on a notice you in their Yeah, exactly, exactly. But well, uh, thank you so much. I don't want to make you late for your for your meeting, but uh, thanks so much for joining us today, Camille. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's great. Thank you. And Andrew, we're going to keep going with you, but I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts about the, this increasing move on uh, on direct messages from different services as well that are sort of increasing that, going from a completely shared environment to bringing it back more back into direct messages? Well, I think that, that people are... Uh I mean, we're going through a process of people realizing that the internet is basically about human beings talking to each other, and allowing people to do that in a way that's useful. I think is is the kind of the the key behind that. And the fact that a number of services have kind of got the message all at the same time is an interesting shift because the, there is very much that sort of um, uh, the technology is becoming more transparent. I think that's that's what it comes down to. It's it's not we're using the internet anymore. You're you're performing a task or you're or you're um, communicating something to another person. It's like when telephone started to become more normalized it yep. wasn't I'm using the telephone it's I'm talking to my friend um, and the medium through which you do that became less and less obvious and, and less and less important in the mix and so um, the idea that SoundCloud which is essentially about um, sharing types of communication whether it's music or audio or, or spoken word or, or whatever but th it's not I mean the, the point of it is not to go that is the message it's rather here is the thing about which we can have a conversation yeah. and, and the, the, the cool thing about the internet being a conversational space is right, here is something, should we talk about this? Here is something else, should we talk about that? And I, I talk about these in terms of social objects, and it could be a YouTube clip or a SoundCloud clip or, or whatever it is, but when you put things on the internet, essentially it's an invitation to a conversation. Yeah. And so it makes sense to me for these sorts of um, services, whether it's Instagram or, or SoundCloud, to go, here is a way in which, or a different way in which you can have a conversation uh, that isn't just about shouting to the world and, and messaging the same as 700,000 people, yeah. you know, check out my stuff, I'm amazing, check me out, I'm brilliant. Uh, have you heard my new thing? But actually saying, well, let's have some sort of meaningful discourse about this. I think that's kind of, that. it makes sense to me. It yeah, and, and on SoundCloud, of course, the conversation is always in public uh, and uh, it has been taking shape as comments on the artist's tracks. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting to see this movement to bringing it more into, into a private uh, sphere. I think the smartest thing SoundCloud ever did was the timestamping of comments. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, that's really interesting because it's not just I'm talking about this piece of music. It's I'm reacting to this right, this bit right here. What you did here is really important to me and that's, uh, that's meaningful. Let's talk about that. Um, and I think that kind of granular um, uh, subject is, is kind of an interesting thing to, to put into a social object. I mean, uh, I can imagine that. I mean, I, I'm surprised actually that's, that YouTube haven't done that. Yeah. Uh, 
so, yeah, it remains to be seen. But but more ways of getting people talking about things is actually good for everybody, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, next, I want to talk about Deezer. Uh, the company is reportedly having conversations with electro uh, electric, uh, electronic giant Samsung around a potential I thought, partnership. I thought it was a done deal. I mean, the, the, um, uh, I, mean I just skimmed the, the news headlines this morning, but it, it looked very much like this is something that is happening. So yeah, um, I mean, it's one of those until you get a confirmation, you never know what's going to happen. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's I mean, why I, I like to say reportedly. <laughs> <laughs> it does kind of cover your bases a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, look, it, it, it makes sense that uh, somebody with a platform and somebody with a distribution mechanism for music should have a conversation, and that's a sort of a, a, a right and meaningful thing to do. I mean, in the in the grand scheme of who's going to win, is it Deezer? Is it Spotify? Is it Audio? Is it you know whatever? Um, a don't really care. Um, B, uh, isn't that interesting that these people are seeing opportunities by collaborating together? People, yeah. Like massive, massive organizations can go, you could be helpful to me, let's have a conversation. And I think it's not just about, I mean, we've had this narrative of buyouts and takeovers and the rest of it for the last five or six years. And actually, when you start to get larger organizations going, you know what, let's work together. Because I've got stuff that you can use and you've got stuff that I can use. What can we make of this? I think. Yeah. Whether or not that's what comes out of this particular deal, it would be nice to think that this is kind of like a market that that's the kind of um, uh, corporate conversation that's going on at this point. But, yeah. I, you know, I'm I certainly mean, not party to those conversations. There's a couple of things that, that are interesting. Like on the one side, uh, these are the last round of funding was $130 million, but dates back to late 2012. So these are might actually be needing to do this new round because, uh, you know, it's a global company. It's, it probably has very high uh, monthly uh, spends as well and, and on licenses and on salaries too. And the other thing is that it's interesting to see whether Samsung takes uh, the deal just because we haven't really seen a big... Uh, headset manufacturer make direct deals with the streaming services as of late it's always been carriers uh, driven uh, and the last uh, i believe uh, i can't remember but I, I think the last manufacturer to really take a leap into the space was nokia which comes with music and that we all know how that end, ended up yeah. uh, and you know even htc tried a partnership with beats which wasn't really music it was more like a hardware related thing but that didn't really work out with them for them either so uh, i'm just wondering whether there is a space for uh, headset to partner with a streaming service and what kind of value that can deliver to to either really well the, i mean the obvious answer is um you buy a mobile phone you get a bundled um streaming service i mean that's uh yeah. I, i'm surprised that doesn't happen more often um but i think there are more interesting conversations to be had there um and just in terms of the ubiquity the sheer ubiquity of, of handsets and, and mobile devices uh and and increasingly so worldwide i think that's hey that's that's a really interesting point um and the ubiquity of music through streaming services the idea that you can access most if you know if not all music that you want to listen to um through these services and actually kind of pairing up those kinds of well, we've got a bottomless well of x and you've got a bottomless <laughs> well of y um you know there's, there's a kind of a connection to be made there but but I think it goes beyond that. You could actually do more interesting stuff in this space. Yeah. Um, and I, I think this is, a, like, this is a starting point. I think the problem with Nokia comes with music is, you know, we put music into a mobile phone, ta-da, and everyone went, so? You know, it's a, like that's not actually a, a revolutionary thing to do. But I think if you have those resources at your fingertips and that ubiquity of uh, access and content, um, then you can start to ask more interesting questions about, right, now what? Uh, and I think that it's the next bit that happens once that deal is done that will be kind of the interesting thing. And it, it would be a shame if um, people who are A, that powerful, and B, that smart could not come up with something that will make us all go, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that, um, and that's really clever. Um, and I, I, that's the bit that I'm waiting for, and it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, sure. And uh, as, a, as a final bit, bit of news, uh, I want to talk about Playlist.net. So it announced the purchase of Topsify's playlists. So these include the UK, UK and US top 40 playlists on Spotify, which together have more than 700,000 followers on the platform, which is quite a lot. So this represents kind of a, a validation, a further confirmation of the value of playlists, uh, which have come under scrutiny in 2013 due to Ministry of Sound's uh, lawsuits uh, against Spotify due to the replication of the Ministry of Sound compilations on the platform's playlists. So, uh, you know, that, that's it's a really interesting space because you know it's, I think it's the first time they were really seeing uh, a, a purchase of a playlist uh, in in that sense because essentially Topsify is a series of playlists, uh, yep. not not much more than that. Uh, and so I'm wondering how that space is going to evolve and and uh, whether we're going to see more of this type of acquisitions, which are more uh, which are metadata acquisitions essentially. Yep. <laughs> Well, I, I, look, I, I think the, the Ministry of Sound thing is really interesting because it says that um, 
these songs in that order belongs to us. And and that's a really interesting thing to say from, from a metadata perspective. It's to say, like, if you arrange things on your shelf in this particular order, that belongs to us. That's our intellectual property. And uh, I, I never found out what the end of that. What was the end of that uh, that case? I'm not sure, Asha. I'm, I, I'm wondering if it's still ongoing. And I, I, I can't re remember talking about it on the show as a resolved thing. Because um, it makes to me, it makes sense from both sides. I can understand yeah. that somebody puts all that work into putting a compilation together, and somebody just replicates that. But from the point of view of the actual mechanics of that, all I've done is I've written a list. And the fact that my list coincides with your list is, is, is nonsensical. But I think the, the kind of the deeper and more interesting thing for me uh, for playlisting is that this is something that radio has known for a long, long time. Music doesn't just make meaning for people on its own. It makes meaning for people in an order. You know, and the, the kind of my, my mission as somebody who, who DJs from time to time is what's the best next song to play? And solving that problem for people and, and solving that question of not just – um, what what is the song, and is this a song I want to own? But what should it be? Before, what should be before and after it? And in yeah. what order should these things go? And building narrative through music with rise and fall, and you know, building excitement and tension. I mean, you know, you can do that as a DJ on the dance floor. You know, build the crowd up and then have it, you know, have it drop and so on. Um, or you can just do it as as a day progresses through, you know, morning to to evening, and getting different moods as things go. Yeah. The the idea of playlisting being a way in which people make meaning through music, uh, I think, is a really rich field because that's that's the only way in which music makes money. Yeah. Is if you make meaning for a lot of people, then you can charge them money for it. And I think that this idea that that um, putting music in an order is really significant to people, even though they don't think about it in that way. But um, what, how they experience music, and this is why radio is so meaningful to people, is this is not just my favorite song followed by my other favorite song. I, I, it was a really good show. Uh, and so those kinds of those sorts of feelings uh, you can you can develop in that space. I think that's really interesting. Whether this is the right service for that, or you know, I mean, seven hundred thousand people is a big number, but it's not all of the people in the world sure. by any stretch. And and for a lot of services, seven hundred thousand people would represent failure. Yeah. So it depends on what they're kind of um, what they're aiming for. And again, it comes down to this idea of. If they can make a sustainable business out of that, then more power to them. That's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's I, I really like the the app on, on playlists on that. If you if listeners haven't downloaded it yet, it's definitely one to check out. If you use Spotify, if you don't, then it's it's it doesn't work quite as well. Uh, and I wanted to um, uh, you know I, of course you know this is something that comes back uh, talking about beats music. Uh, I, I haven't talked about it this week just because I'm sure next week is going to be all about beats music after the the launch. Uh, but uh, you know they've announced a list of uh, really big names uh, in the radio and uh, online music world. The blogging world, label world, that have joined Beats uh, to create playlists. So obviously they are placing a high value on that. Well, I think curation is really important, and I think that um, Ian Rogers certainly gets that. This this idea that um, one of the ways in which you know playlists can be meaningful to people is that they represent a particular person's curation and taste and so on. So yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Is actually putting somebody in a room that says, I'm going to choose these songs for people, and that's going to be significant. And I think that's, that's something that not a lot of people are doing. Yeah. Um, a lot, I mean, like, for instance, iTunes uh, Genius, for instance, is all about the algorithm. It's about, um, like, let's find songs that you already own and put them in a particular order for you that, that kind of is at least loosely connected. And that's one way of making meaning from uh, a, a bunch of music and just sort of grouping it. But having somebody sit down and go, you know what, I know music and I know my music and let me play you songs that are really meaningful to me. I, mean, that, I think that's, that's a piece of communication that's really valuable. And I think that's, that's something that it sounds like they're doing right. Awesome. Well, I'm just going to uh, finish by reading a couple of uh, news headlines that we, of course, we didn't get the chance to talk about. We can't talk about everything uh, on the show, otherwise it'd be five hours long. And to finish up, uh, a couple of quick headlines. Oasis have, lined, uh, have joined the streaming fold as their catalog appeared on Spotify, Deezer and Ardy on Monday morning. So uh, one less streaming holdout out there. Uh, Beyonce's sales have exceeded in four weeks of her previous album, Four. Of course, it was released in, in that uh, sort of secretive manner that made it quite uh, headline uh, worthy. And uh, uh, the singer also penned an essay on gender inequality for the Shriver Report, uh, which is uh, examining the rates of financial insecurity amongst American women. So definitely go and check that out. It's, it's quite interesting uh, to read. And finally, Frozen Soundtrack last week reached the top spot on the Billboard album charts in the US, uh, the first Disney movie to reach the top spot since Pocahontas in 1995, uh, although it didn't sell very much. It sold 165,000 copies, I think, which is pretty low for number one uh, on the Billboard chart. Uh, and uh, already there are rumors of a Broadway adaptation underway, so definitely a successful uh, Disney movie there. And, uh, well, uh, thanks 
so much, Andrew. It was a real pleasure having you. And uh, again, uh, let me uh, plug uh, musictechfest.org and also your book. Uh, so let me just pull up the title once again radio uh, in the digital age radio, radio in the yeah. digital age dot com and you can also find uh, there's also um, I think I've thrown the links uh, there in the recommendations page on a uh, digital music trends that goes straight into Amazon so uh, if you are, are, are on DMT and listening to the show from there you can uh, head to that page and uh, buy it uh, right away uh, thanks so much Andrew it was a pleasure having you on Oh, it's lovely to be here. Thanks very much for having me. And thanks so much for listening. DMT comes out every week, of course. Uh, uh, you should also tune in to the DMT one-to-one show uh, where I interview interesting startups and music tech projects on a one-to-one uh, basis. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a great week. And until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.